appreciate that. This is a real building at Wright-Patterson. Uh, it's building 65. How many people work at the base? Great. All right, now this is where it gets scary. How many people are intelligence officers at the base? Okay, there's usually one person who's an intelligence officer and they never raise their hand, so I'll, have to, I'll, I'll figure out who they are later, definitely. This is the artwork from, from the cover, and uh, I started work at Wright-Patterson in 1973 as a cooperative education student from the University of Detroit. And I had such a great career that if I had to do it all over again, I would on, on one basis, that I would become 20 years old again and I would be back in college. So for a moment, we're going to turn it back to 1973. Okay, this is 1973. This is the building that I worked in. Uh, on the right side was the management complex. The empty hangar had pretty much nothing in it except spiders. And on the left side was kind of a matching office which held the greasy spoon. I'm a 20-year-old cooperative education student, and I was assigned to a guy that we're going to call Al. Al was a GS 11 or 12 engineer at the time. He was responsible for me. He was going to bring me up to speed. And Al said during my first week, why don't we go from point A to point B, go to the Greasy Spoon. I want to get you a, a welcoming Hershey bar, a little snack. I said, fine. So we step into this hangar, and it's dark, and there's nothing there. It is now the Wright Field Fitness Center. So those of you who go there obviously know that is. So we step into this hangar. And the first thing he says to me, this is like week one. And he says, have you heard about our aliens? <laughs> what? Yes, um, we have aliens on the base. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, there was a crash in 1947. And the aliens and all the records was brought here for examination. And with dripping sarcasm, I said, really? <laughs> He said, yeah, well, they keep them in the tunnels. We have tunnels? <laughs> Everywhere. They keep the aliens in the tunnels. Yes, they do. So I said, well, can we go see these aliens in the tunnels? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a secret, how do you know about it? Because it's, it's a poorly kept secret. Everybody knows about it. So apparently, I was only allowed to say the word secret three times in a single conversation. Because when I said, can we go see the secret place, he goes, grab the Hershey bar, let's go back to work. That was 1973. So from that point on, I was very curious. And every chance I had, I was looking in corners or every contractor's place that I went to, I was peeking around the corners in the dark spaces. And I was trying to answer the question, is that just a bunch of BS that Al fed me? And for the next 40 plus years, I read a few articles. In 1997, that picked up steam when a gigantic craft flew across the entire state of Arizona, now known as the Phoenix Lights. It was videotaped by many folks. It's probably one of the most famous sightings ever. And I just dove headfirst into my research. Then in 2008, I started to do field research, and it got really, really intense. The results of my investigation were to answer the question, have we been visited? And the results of what I've done are captured in this book, which I self-published uh, nearly two years ago. This book has been endorsed by four world-class UFO researchers, some of the names you might recognize, and their faces. Nick Pope is on the left. He ran the UFO desk for the Ministry of Defense. Nick Pope is always on Ancient Aliens and just about every UFO show that's on television. Nick also wrote The Encounter in Rendlesham Forest and several other books on the topic. Nick Pope is probably one of the top five UFO researchers in the world. Uh, Nick actually reviewed the first three chapters of my book and gave me some great feedback. And the reason I enlisted the help of these great researchers is that I wanted to vet the information that I was putting in my book so I would be confident that once it got published, it had already been through the toughest exam that it could have and that you would get the best information possible. Next to Nick Pope is Paul Davids. Paul wrote and produced the movie Roswell that starred Martin Sheen. Uh, it got a Golden Globe nomination. Next is Yvonne Smith. Yvonne is the world's foremost hypnotic regressionist. Uh, she's world famous. She's been on all the TV shows. She's written several books. 
And of course, there I am. This photograph was taken at the International UFO Congress in 2016. We were all at the same banquet table together. I made sure I bought copies of the book so we could get this marketing photo. And as a testament to their expertise, three of my four endorsers were speakers at the International UFO Congress. So uh, it's, it's been through the ringer, and I really appreciate their support. You've had a rough week. It's Saturday, and I'm going to kind of lighten your burden a little bit. Leading psychiatrists have said that in any talk of this length or longer, you're only ever going to remember three things. So to make it easy, I'm going to tell you the three things you're going to remember today. The first is, Wright, Pat, Roswell, and UFOs are connected. And I will prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt today. The second and probably the most important point is Ray's book is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, investigating UFOs is serious business, often filled with adventure, fun, and a little terror. I'm going to share some of my misadventures with you today, because they do happen along the road. So we got to go back to a dusty spot about 200 miles southeast of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's 1947. I'm sorry about that, but I'll try to read through this. Matt Brazel was a rancher. He was a foreman of a ranch called the Foster Ranch. And it was basically a sheep ranch. One day, he's out in the pasture. He notices that his sheep are running around, making a big loop around this debris field, which was about 3 quarters of a mile long by several hundred feet wide. So he picked up some of this stuff. And on his next trip into Roswell, New Mexico, he took the debris to the sheriff, George Wilcox. Wilcox looked at this and said, I've never seen anything like this. How about you, Mac? He goes, well, you know, I've picked up a lot of things like weather balloons on the ranch before. This doesn't look like anything I've seen. What are we going to do? So they decided to take the debris to the Roswell Army Airfield. They let the experts look at it. And a couple of those experts were the intelligence officers, Jesse Marcel, who is a major, and Captain Sheridan Cavett. Their commander, William Blancher said, what I want you to do is go with that rancher out to Roswell, about a 70-mile drive down some horrendous roads, I know, because I drove them this past summer. Why don't you go ahead and collect more debris? So they drove up in a staff car and what's called a carry-all. And a carry-all is nothing more than uh, a 1947 version of today's SUV. That's what it is. So go collect some more debris. And when they did, they came back and did an analysis. And when that analysis was complete, they gave this information to the Roswell Daily Record. They said, hey, we've got a flying saucer. Well, you can imagine what happened next when that little piece of information made it around the world. The Air Force was inundated with requests for information. It basically shut them down because they didn't have all the communications that we have today. They basically had telephone lines and telegraph lines. So the Air Force said, this is an untenable situation. We're just out of World War II. We got to protect the country. We think we need to take the air out of this little saucer story. So thus started what Stanton Friedman, world famous researcher, said is the cosmic cover-up. And the way that they covered up the story is, is they flew the principal witness, Jesse Marcel. He was the first person from the Air Force to handle this crash wreckage. They flew him and the crash wreckage to the 8th Army Air Force headquarters, manned by General Ramey in Fort Worth. Marcel brought some of the actual stuff in. He discussed it with Ramey. Ramey excused everybody. They took that away, and they brought in a real weather balloon. And he forced Jesse Marcel to pose with it for the photographers from the newspaper. He was told, and he said the story later, I was told to shut my mouth and not to say anything. What the general failed to tell Marcel is, and don't give away the story with your eyes. Look at his eyes. <laughs> you know what he's saying? Sure, boss. This is what I brought in here. That's the only way he communicated. And 30 years after the fact, Jesse Marcel told his story to Stanton Friedman, told him exactly what happened. And during that interview, Jesse Marcel said, 
talking about the crash wreckage that he escorted. It wasn't a weather balloon. It was nothing of this earth. Further evidence that whatever was picked up came to Wright Patterson, and this is unassailable knowledge. The chief of staff at the time in this office was a General DuBose, and he was quoted in a signed affidavit that General McMullen, who was, I think, SAC chief of staff at the time, he shipped the debris on his personal plane to the aeronautical labs at Wright Field for further analysis. Whatever it was picked up in that desert came to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now, I don't normally talk about this because I haven't fully investigated Hangar 18. But I will share with you what I know. And I'll, I'll tell you the story according to Ray, because I think that's important. What, who here has heard about Hangar 18? Yeah, most everybody. And basically, the story goes that Hangar 18 contains one, the material from the Roswell. It either was stored there or is still stored there. And two, the aliens, the occupants of the ship, are also stored there. This is just kind of the common, basic Hangar 18 story. The problem is, unlike that newspaper article that we saw that said, we found the flying saucer, there is no document where we can trace down that mentions Hangar 18 the first time. It just came into the lexicon like LOL or one of those things. Who was the first person to LOL a text? I don't think we know. And we still don't know who the first person was to mention Hangar 18, but this is the story. So here's my humble opinion. Let's talk about the debris. We've heard this, this famous line, we don't need no stinking badges. Well, for the Roswell story to be true, we don't need no stinking Hangar 18. If you study the story of the Roswell debris, it was thousands of small fragments. They spent a day and a half picking them up. The largest piece was only two foot by three foot. It was a metal piece. And this is unlikely in a long-term scenario, because here's what would happen today. I spent most of my career in Air Force research labs. Probably what happened is they brought it in. Yeah, it stayed in the hangar for a day or two. They assigned a group of scientists to come in, grab a couple handfuls of the stuff, and take it back to their lab. It could have been an office. It could have been an office this big with a little tiny machine or a microscope. You don't need a Hangar 18 to store that material. It wasn't like it was a 100-foot spaceship. It was just thousands of small fragments. And the biggest piece, as Jesse Marcel told everybody, was only two foot by three foot. OK. What about the aliens? Jesse Marcel never mentioned aliens. And so the theory is there's actually two sites. And it does make sense. For that particular craft, part of it exploded for whatever reason. It dropped the debris there where Mac Browso found it. And then about 40 to 60 miles later, whatever was left, a big chunk of it, dropped to the ground with the occupants. And there's been some theories about that. But Jesse Marcel went to what's called the skip site, where perhaps the craft impacted, left all that debris, and then took off for another you know, 40 miles and then landed in a big chunk. He was quoted as saying, had there been bodies of aliens in the debris, I would have picked them up and brought them in. There are, however, many other witnesses who claim that they saw aliens. I have not investigated that aspect of the case, but I say it is certainly possible. Is Wright Patterson the place that they would have brought the debris and the aliens? Yes, for many reasons. It was the center of, of aeronautical engineering in the world, the world-class center. They had scientists, equipment, money, security clearances, buildings, contracting. We got a former contracting agent here, so he'll verify this. So if they didn't have the expertise in-house or the equipment, they would contract for it. They would bring it in, and they would do the analysis. So Wright-Patterson was a facility that certainly could have taken in the aliens and taken in the material and done an analysis of it. And we're going to get into the aliens a little bit later. Also, Hangar 18 to keep aliens. And you hear these stories, and I've seen it in documentaries. And that's the point where I start screaming at the television, this is bull. Why would they keep them in a hangar? They wouldn't do that. Can you imagine an alien in the hangar? It's such a smell after a couple of days, OK? So it's also a, another unlikely long-term scenario. 
Wright Pat is famous for having Project Blue Book. For 22 years, they collected military UFO sightings and civilian UFO sightings. The first instantiation was called Sign, second was Grudge, and third was the famous Blue Book. So Wright Patterson is intimately connected to UFOs as a minimum through Project Blue Book. Captain Edward J. Rappelt. Now we're going to get into a little bit of strangeness, uh, conspiracy, that type of thing. I know everyone likes a good little conspiracy. From, I think it was 1951 through the end of 52, uh, he had a Project Blue Book and was probably the best leader they had because he wanted to investigate. Blue Book eventually became just a public relations effort. They were inundated with requests for uh, analysis, reports. They couldn't get to it all. They were short-staffed. And so their job became one of just explaining away the sightings rather than going and investigating them and trying to find the truth about them. Interesting conspiratorial thing about Repelt is he wrote a book. It's called The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. So it was originally published in 1956. I have a copy of that book. And that book is pro-UFO. It says, folks, I was at the helm of this project. And as a result, I conclusively say, we have been visited. We have the evidence. Lo and behold, three years later, another book, same title, same author, gets published in 1959. It adds three chapters. The new final chapter totally repudiates the official position taken in the first book. It says, I'm positive UFOs don't exist. What the heck is that about? You write a book, you spend years at the head of Project Blue Book, you write a book saying, here's all the evidence, the best evidence, and yes, we've been visited. So you gotta ask what happened. Oh, and to add to the mystery, you know when a book gets published, and I know this for a fact, the year it gets published, it gets stamped with that year. So 1956, you get a 1956 stamp on it. When this second mysterious book showed up in 1959, the publishers put a 1956 date on it. Why would that be? Maybe so somebody could confuse the two, and if they got rid of all the first ones, they might pick up the second ones and think that the head of Project Blue Book didn't think much of UFOs. Strange mystery. And Repelt uh, was supposedly pressured into doing that. Who knows? One of the cool things that Repelt did, because he was serious about getting to the bottom of this whole thing, is he had the Battelle Corporation in Columbus. They're a fabulous research facility. Anybody here heard of Battelle, Columbus? Yeah, we're all familiar with them. They do science, research, engineering. They're great. So he hired Battelle and said, hey, we've got 3,200 of these reports. Can you classify them? Can you tell us, is there anything to them? You know, give us something that we can feed up the chain and that we can tell the public. Either we got stuff or we don't have stuff. So that's what they did. And they created this thing called the Special Report. Unfortunately, it was published long after Rappel left the uh, Project Blue Book. After the report came out, the Secretary of the Air Force, Donald Quarles, I call him the Sinister Minister of Misinformation. <laughs> now, at one time, late in my career, I was the director of the Installation Civilian Wellness Program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I was responsible for improving the health and wellness of the 10,000 base civilians. I worked directly for the base commander, Bradley Spacey. He was a colonel then. He's now a two-star general running the base down in San Antonio. So I was handpicked to go ahead as an executive on an executive transfer, plunked down there in Building 10, and I worked for him. And I know that when I briefed him, I would take my 50 slides and I would make it into three sentences so he could brief it up the chain. Like if he had to go to Washington and explain why do you have a full-time senior engineer running your wellness program? Okay, so I know that you've got to roll up a lot of data. But I think that former Secretary of the Air Force, Donald Qualls, 
took that one step too far. And this is the quote he came away with after the Battelle study was published. He said, on the basis of this study, we believe that no objects, such as those popularly described as flying saucers, have overflown the United States. Hmm. I feel certain that even the unknown 3% could have been explained as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been obtained. OK. A couple of problems with this. In fact, there's many problems. I'll point two of them out to you. The Battelle report proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that the more data you had, the more difficult it was to explain away what was seen. So in cases where a pilot saw something in the air, at the same time radar got it on the ground, and it was a ground observation and whatnot, those were the most difficult UFO sightings to say it was Venus. So he's saying, well, if we had more data, we could have explained it away. No, I know it's counterintuitive, but the facts point out the more witnesses you have, the more difficult it is to explain it away as a reflection off Venus. Also, he said that there were only 3% unknown. Eh, wrong, thanks for playing. It turns out it was 30.8% because the unknowns were actually 21.5%, and the insufficient info category, which still meant that they were unexplained, was 9.3%. Ladies and gentlemen, we do a little bit of quick math, and we have 30.8%. So somewhere, Secretary Quarles left out a zero. <laughs> so got to do your own homework. That's the point of the slide. Was he given bad data? I don't know. He's a busy man. He was Secretary of the Air Force. High strangeness number three. We were told in 1969 the content report came out of Colorado, which was a setup job, I might add. They needed a report by somebody reputable in the science field to close down Project Blue Book, and they were able to do that when the Condon Report came out. If you read the Condon Report, the conclusions they reach at the beginning do not reflect the facts that are contained in the report. You got to dig down. The front part says, we didn't find anything significant here. We should close down Project Blue Book. When you read the details of that very thick document, you will find out exactly the opposite is true. Do your homework. So we were told in 1969, no more UFO reporting system. Oh, wait a minute. The guy that canned Blue Book, here's a quote. Reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accord with Jan F-146 or Air Force Manual 5511 and are not part of the Blue Book system. What? We have a backdoor way of reporting UFOs that are not part of Blue Book? Termination of Blue Book would leave no official federal office to receive reports of UFOs. However, as already stated, reports which could affect national security would, can be, would, be, would continue to be handled through the standard Air Force procedures designed for this purpose. What? So they told everyone there was no reporting system for UFOs, but the guy that can Project Blue Book tells you that there is. I'm intrigued. All right, we're going to lighten up a bit. <laughs> when I worked at Wright-Patterson, you could tell the people that you could talk to about UFOs because they had a little 8.5 by 11 Xerox sheet that had this chart on it, the Air Force UFO identification chart. That was like, you know, in the 60s, a guy with long hair, you know, you knew he was hip. Well, this was the way we ID'd the people that you could talk UFOs about in the workplace, except it was, it was a, a you know, sheet form. Today, they've upped the ante because now they print these on the back of, of t-shirts. And I can tell you that this is a real employee at White Patterson wearing this shirt. Note, you've got Klingon spaceships and satellites and the you know, stealth bomber and all that. And they're all identified as a weather balloon. If you check the weather balloon, it's been identified as swamp gas. <laughs> Thank you, J. Allen Hynek. So let's get a little bit into my book, and then we'll kind of bounce around and dig deeper into Wright-Patterson. I'm going to take you down some stairwells, some dark stairwells. So what I did is I went on this quest for the truth. And how did I do that? I visited famous sites. I did the research. I talked to witnesses and experts. I tried to find new evidence, and I tried to prove or disprove the stories. I didn't care which way it went. 
I just wanted to know, is there anything to this? And one of the best places to start is, and, and you all know, especially the contracting guy, when you're going to do research, you have to do a literature search. What's out there? I'm going to learn something. Do I, don't, do I want to reinvent the wheel? Probably not. So that's what I did. I started with all the, the famous books, went to the famous sites. 1965, Incident at Exeter, fully documented in this book by John Fuller. It involved, let's see if this works, Norman Muscarello was 19 years old, about to go into the Army during the um, Vietnam era, spent two tours on a gunboat going up and down the river. The guy was a brave man. Officer Bertrand, Officer Hunt, Officer Scratch Tolan. In 1965, that gentleman was walking down the road. And when he got to this location, right here behind the stone wall, a 90-foot UFO appeared right there. He panicked, ran across the street, fell into a ditch. The UFO backed away. He went up on this porch and he knocked loud. He wanted to, to get help. They never answered the door. They thought that it was a drunk. Had they come out in time, they too would have seen Norman Muscarello's UFO. So Norman comes in with this great story. Scratch Tolan said, I know this kid. He doesn't make this stuff up. He's a tough kid. He's level-headed. I'm going to send Officer Bertrand out back to him. So they did. And back here down Route 150, they go out into a field. You'll see an aerial view of that in just a minute. The UFO reappears. Now he's got a cop with him. They're in the field. Bertrand gets down on one knee, removes a service revolver, aims it at the UFO, and goes, uh, not today. Puts it back in his holster. And while they're waiting to figure out what to do, Officer Hunt pulls up. Now the three of them are standing in the field, and there is that 90-foot UFO 100 feet over their head. And it gradually moves off to Hampton. So I show up one day to do my field investigation at that house. I don't know who owns the home. I do know that it was owned by Clyde Russell. Clyde Russell was made famous in the book Incident at Exeter. So I knock on the door, and eventually around the backside, who do I find? Arthur Russell, son of Clyde Russell. At the time of the UFO, he had owned the house next door. He knew the story. I told him why I was there. He toured me around the whole property. He showed me where the UFO sat during the day hiding and why everyone who saw it, it was coming from one direction. Very, very interesting. That whole story is covered in my book. He also introduced me to some witnesses who did not come forward to be in the John Fuller book. Some of those conversations are in my book. Do your homework. Go to the site in the John Fuller book. John says, when Norman saw the UFO, he dove behind a large stone wall for protection. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a stone wall he dove behind. Does that look like a large stone wall to you? I said, well, no wonder he got back up and ran across the street, because it wasn't any protection. So I brought this to Arthur's attention. That on this day, Arthur was 84 years old, sharp as a tack. So I said, um, Arthur and I explained the whole story to him. You know, we dove down behind this brick wall, hoping he'd say, oh, yes, over the years it fell and we removed, you know, the rocks or something that was very believable. He looked at the stone wall. He goes, well, maybe it was taller back then. <laughs> so I figured we're moving on because I'm not going to argue with farmer logic. One of the best days I ever had in ufology. So um, I had parked down the road and I, going a little bit south, to see the field where the police officers and Norman were when Norman saw the UFO for the second time that night. And this is where uh, Norman saw it the first time. This is his second sighting uh, in this field, which is now an equestrian center. So that night I came back and I parked right here in this space where I'd parked uh, during the day. And when I got back there, someone had moved a 30-foot Komatsu front loader there, so I couldn't park in the same parking spot that I had been in during the daytime. I should have taken that as a warning. I didn't. So I pull my rental car. No, I did not have a Ferrari. <laughs> so I pull it up there because I want to be here because there is the field. And I wanted to walk down this dark road because on the 3rd of September, I think it was 1965, it was so dark 
you could not see, it was a moonless night, you could not see your hand in front of your face, so described in the John Fuller book. So I wanted to walk down that road and I wanted to get that feeling of what it was like. And it was a September of the year 2008, so similar conditions, moonless night. And I had seen a car come down here, I saw the headlights and boop, they blinked out. I thought, well that's odd, well maybe they just went behind this tree, because you can see it's all tree line. This is very narrow lane, one and a half cars. So I'm parked facing that direction. I didn't think anything of it. Windows rolled down, nice September evening. Next thing you know, I hear a female voice. Go high. What? <laughs> I go high. I was stunned, because I thought this car had moved out, and I saw no lights coming at me right here. So I said, hi, what are you doing here? Ooh. Okay, they already got a Komatsu front loader where I'm supposed to be parked, and now they sent a disembodied voice. <laughs> I said, well, and I tried to explain, I'm a researcher, I'm, I'm taking pictures, I want to see what it's like when Muscarella was there. And she said, there's nothing here to see, they're not coming back. So I tried to explain again, you know, I'm this researcher, I'm going to do the Muscarella thing, and she cuts me off, she goes, there's nothing here to see, they're not coming back, you need to leave. Okay, so I had to roll the dice just once. So I said, and I can't see anything. I don't hear a car, I don't see a car. I'm just listening to a voice that's outside my window. So I say, not being a smart ass actually, <laughs> I said, how do you know they're not coming back? And I got the same thing, it was almost like a recording. There's nothing for you to see, they're not coming back, you need to leave. All right, now think about this. I'd come all that way to research, all that way to get something maybe to write about. I grew up in Detroit. I have four brothers and a sister. She was tougher than the boys. And I'm a street kid from Detroit, okay? So I know how to handle myself. So I'm thinking, did I come all that way to be intimidated and leave that spot without finishing my research? You bet I did. <laughs> I got my butt out of there as fast as I could because I figured if they're going to send a lady out there to intimidate me, she's going to be one tough lady. So I left. I came back the next night to finish it off. So you never know what's going to happen when you're doing research. In 1980 in Rendlesham Forest, a UFO landed. This is one of the guys that got within a couple feet of it. He was with a, his name is John Burroughs. He was there with Airman. Uh, Jim Penniston, they were security police. They're not the people that pull you over for speeding on base. They're the people who throw you to the ground when you're at some place on the base that you shouldn't be. They're the guys who handcuff you and have the guns. Oh, and by the way, I'm six foot tall. Okay, John is a big boy. So John and Jim are in this forest. They see this thing. It's a triangular black craft. Jim Penniston touches it. He gets a download of a digital code that he kept secret for 30 years. I don't have time to get into it. I cover it a little bit in my book. It's also covered in Nick Pope's book. So this is uh, Colonel Halt. He was in charge of the, he was deputy commander of Bentwaters and Woodbridge. And this happened just outside Woodbridge base. This is in fact the landing strip uh, for Woodbridge. And you head out the, what's called the East Gate. You come down here about 50 feet. And that's where this gentleman and his fellow police officer entered the woods that night to find their UFO. Three nights later, two nights later, three nights later, Colonel Hulk goes out there with two dozen security police. And they're chasing UFOs through the forest for four hours. These UFOs are beaming spotlights down into the weapons storage area, which had nuclear weapons. The people who were in charge of that security have gone on tape to say we had nuclear weapons. In my discussion with Colonel Halt, he will tell me we did not have nuclear weapons on the base, and I can't say anything about that because of the security. So I decided that I just had to visit this place. So in 2012, I went to Rendlesham Forest. Many cool things happened. I will tell you one of them. There's a car park where that red X is. Now that red X is historically significant because it's the entry point where Penniston and Burroughs and Colonel Halt and his team enter the forest to try to go in and research these landings and the activity that happened over a three night period. So I got my map in hand and I had talked to the principals before I went there so I knew exactly where to go into the forest. 
And what was parked right there where I was going to go in was this van with these tinted windows. And I thought, well, that's very strange because there's signs there that says don't park on the road. And 50 feet away is a big parking lot. There's like three cars. You probably parked 30 in there. Well, I didn't think anything of it. And I didn't get close to it because one of two things were possible. One, I would be kidnapped. And Liam Neeson was not around. <laughs> so I didn't want to take the chance. Or there would be a soccer mom, soccer mom in there changing a diaper. In either case, I didn't want any part of it. But I did take this photograph. And if you look in my book, and I know you will, you'll notice that I did not publish the license plate. Okay? But if you were to take this number and you were to get on a couple of websites in England, what you would find is, is this car is from RAF Molesworth area. What's RAF Molesworth? It's an intelligence center. Okay? So this car which came from an area that hosts RAF Molesworth Intelligence Center, is two hours outside its own neighborhood and just casually parks it right at a historically significant UFO site. You got to ask the question, why? So I thought, well, maybe surveillance. I never saw anybody. I talked to people in the area. Nobody owned up to owning the van. So um, I just thought this was just one of the interesting things that happened to you along the way. Let's get into some paranormal happenings that right. Oh, and that whole story, my, my Reynoldson visit and all that, that's all contained in the book. Strange burials, building 219 and building 70. Hit the home stretch. I always ask myself the question, could aliens be buried at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? And you go, well, that's not possible. They wouldn't put aliens in the ground at Wright-Patterson. OK. Anybody here an attorney? Any, any legal guys? I know some. OK, great. Precedence is big in the court of law. OK, right? Agreed. Good, he's shaking his head. It's big. So is there precedence for putting unusual things in the ground at Wright-Patterson? Because I'm trying to see if maybe they would put aliens there. Let's see what was buried there. 2,100 chem chemical bomblets. That's not unusual. They found them. They were buried there sometimes in the 40s. And they were discovered when they excavated for a new fire station. Hmm. How about toxic waste in barrels behind the fourth hole of Twin Base Golf Course? And if they're going to bury toxic waste, they will put anything in the ground at Wright-Patterson. I talked to Bill Cumley. He was the head pro at the time. He told me he spent three years dealing with the Environmental Protection Agency while they got that stuff out of the ground and they remediated. He spent more time talking to the EPA than he did the golf course members. Oh, and let's not forget the human remains in an ancient Adena mound that might go back 3,000 years. OK, anybody see this on uh, Hobson Boulevard just outside the back gate when you come in in Area B? Mm -hmm. Thousands of people go by that every day, and they don't know what that is. That is an ancient Adena culture burial site. They found bones in there. They did a non-intrusive survey of that back in, I think it was 1989. If you go there today, you will discover, whoops, not that. You will discover all the trees have been removed. They cut them down earlier this year. I went in. I did an inspection. I took a photograph of every tree stump. Not a single tree is diseased or was in trouble of falling down. The official word came out. They met with the Indian tribe that was responsible for owning that mound. And they feared that the trees were going to crumble down and destroy the site. That was published in the Skywriter. OK, maybe, maybe not. The other excuse was they wanted to return it to a more traditional look because the uh, burial mounds are kept free of trees and stuff like that. I'll buy that one. So 50-50, I'm on the fence. What else did that non-intrusive survey find? It found two objects in the mound that are metallic that measure five meters. Hmm. Doing my homework, I discovered that the ancient Adena culture owned nothing larger than copper axe heads, <laughs> about that big. I don't think they're swinging a copper axe head that's 18 to 20 inches big. So it begs the question, what are those metal things that are in this ancient Adena burial mound? Oh, and the way that I'm sure that it's there is because I found a book of which there are only a handful of copies, which states specifically that there are two objects in there that are measuring half a meter by half a meter. OK, 
Now imagine if you would, that's about 18 by 18. Imagine if I get a little casket for maybe a four foot person, and then I take that casket and I drop it in this way, boop. And now I'm looking down on it with a survey and it's 18 by 18. Very good place to hide an alien, wouldn't you say? Because that is a, a national place, you can't dig there. So if you wanted to hide it, great place. Also, wouldn't it be symbolic of taking a super advanced civilization and interring it with the oldest civilization at Wright-Patterson? It'd be a great place. All that and other burial sites that I've investigated at Wright-Pat, it's all covered in the book. Oh, and that's TGI Fridays, by the way. <laughs> this is full disclosure. Okay, this is building 219. In 1947, it was a regional hospital. It would have been the first place aliens would have passed through. It would have been their first stop. Why? Because it was the medical facility on the base. They had the doctors, the equipment. There was a vault there. You're going to see that vault later. In fact, I'm going to take you to the basement of that building because it's creepy. And I was supposed to do this around Halloween, so, you know, I changed some slides last night, but for the most part, you're getting the Halloween version. There's a long history of paranormal activity. It includes windows being opened mysteriously. They lock down the building, they come back in the morning, the windows are open. Who did it? Cleaning ladies? We didn't do it. There are disembodied voices. The doctors and nurses who work there have claimed they've heard voices in the hallways. They cannot trace it down to anybody who's nearby. Doors are locking and unlocking themselves. I'm going to show you a little sign to prove it is still happening today. And I interviewed current people working in that building because I'm a photographer for the Air Force Marathon. That office is in building 219. I go there frequently. They have told me about the mysterious locking and unlocking doors. Spirits roaming the halls. And how do I know all this? Because I've interviewed the people and they wrote about it in the base newspaper. There are actually two articles that go through the whole history of the haunted nature of Building 219, which was investigated by TAPS. When TAPS came in, the Atlantic Paranormal Society, and they did their TV show, that's one of the buildings they went into. This was taken just before the Air Force Marathon. This was taped on the door. I kid you not. The doors are still unlocking themselves. I just happened to have my camera with me, shot it, and they're basically saying, hey, if you're leaving it, lock the doors. Again, they're locking the doors, they're coming back, and the doors are open. And I, I've been in that building, and I know there's a couple of special keys you need to use. So to unlock itself is not a simple thing. You've got to have a little, like, uh, uh, Allen wrench. Oh, I didn't give away a security thing right there. <laughs> okay, so building 19, who wants to visit the creepy basement? Long paranormal, okay. I know everybody wants to. Look at the institutional tile. So we're going downstairs. There we go. It is a creepy place the day I visited. So we are indeed in building 219 in the basement because this evacuation sign tells you we're there. The morgue area, the former morgue area, and look what I found on the floor. Looked like blood to me. Had no idea what it was, and I didn't stick around to test it. Okay, but I want to look. I said, hey, if aliens passed through here in 1947, you know, they had the morgue, they had an operating room, they had doctors, they had equipment. Dead or alive aliens would have passed through Building 219, in my estimation. I just had to go and see. Famous story. Um, a group of officers were in the building long after it had been turned into a pediatric clinic. And they were in a conference room down in that creepy basement. And they heard children running and playing and talking. And they thought, well, this is unusual because this is a business office and there shouldn't be any children. So during their break, they went around and they looked around the offices and they asked people, are there any children in the building? And everyone said, no, there's no children in the building. So they went back to the meeting. Sure enough, they restart the meeting and there's children again. They hear them laughing, talking, or whatever. That is actually documented in one of the newspaper articles. Now, these are officers that wouldn't want to tell anybody what was going on because your OER is not going to look so good next time. But they, they said, and when I went in the basement, I found this is really unusual. It's been decades since it was a pediatric clinic. Why is this height chair in that building? Does it have a spirit? I don't know. And the other question is, they had totally re renovated that building. Why didn't they do the basement? Hmm, something going on down there. So I wanted to get to the bottom of it. I found the vault. 
So if they had aliens, dead or alive, they could have stored them there overnight. Well, what was in the vault? All right. Do you think I went all this way to be intimidated again by that dark, creepy door at the basement that I was going to give up? No, man, I opened the door. And here's what I found. It was something that was still critical to Air Force operations. It was full of coffee. <laughs> I kid you not. From top to bottom, it was full of coffee. <laughs> OK. We've lost the mic. Have we lost the mic? No. Are we good? Yeah. Par for the course. How about that? Yeah. Better? OK, great. So it was full of coffee. How am I doing on time? Great. 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 OK. Boop, boop, boop. Last couple of slides. TAPS came in and they did all of these uh, buildings and rooms. And Building 70 is one of the rooms that they declared to be haunted. They did um, the Arnold House. They did Building 219. They did Building 70. I can't remember the fourth one they did. But Building 70 and the Arnold House both gave uh, indications that they were haunted. Rachel Castle is the person who was the public affairs official that served as the liaison between the TAPS production crew and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. One of the reasons they came to Wright-Patterson is because Rachel had a paranormal experience. One day, while she was leaving Building 70, where public affairs was housed, she saw a woman standing behind the glass that was in the door that she had just walked through. And it just wasn't a fleeting glance. She had a long time view of this person. And in fact, it was such a long look at this person that she gave me the following description, which I think is significant. And I'm only mentioning this because I want to open up the possibilities that strange things can do and will happen at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So this is Building 70, and somewhere in here, her car was parked. She left. She saw this thing. This is an incredible description. It's not just like, I saw a face. So if you'll let me, I'll read it. And then I think I have one slide afterwards. What is funny is that unless I tell them, people always assume I saw someone from a much earlier time. That is not the case. I'm a huge fan of fashion. So maybe I paid more attention than a casual observer. But with my experience in sewing and garment construction, and here's what's mind blowing, her description. I could tell that her blouse was bright white with front ruffles. Look like cotton or a cotton polyester mix. Overlaying the blouse, which had long sleeves, was a type of knit jumper that was blue in color. Are you kidding me? If I saw somebody, a ghost, I'm heading in the other direction. She is giving me a full fashion description. Not royal blue or light blue, but actually a type of dark teal leaning toward blue and not green. Kind of like the color of a dark topaz blue. This had thin straps that came up around her shoulders and over the blouse. It may have been a vest, but given the design of the clothing, it looked much more like the top to a jumper, which would have had a skirt on the bottom half. And this is really telling, except I could only see her top half due to the glass only being in the top half of the door. She had short hair that was curled close to her head and was kind of dirty blonde color. If I had to guess her age, and this is hard for me to do, but I would say she was somewhere in her late 30s or early 40s. Although given the different styling from today's styles, that might be inaccurate. The other troubling thing is that I first saw what looked like a dark shadow. Then as it came closer to the doorway, I was outside, she was inside, good thing. Her form became clearly visible. Her skin and face looked human, except that something was off. It reminded me of a wax figure or mannequin with no expression, like a body without a soul. It was disturbing to say the least, and she was looking at me as I turned my car away and started to drive away. Her figure turned the direction I was driving. My car was parked pretty much straight out the door. That was enough. Really? That was enough? It took you all of that? 
I took off in my car and have not seen the figure other than the one encounter. This was December 18, 2007 at approximately 7.30 p.m. And here's the clincher. I remember that because it was on my birthday. I was working late due to working on the upcoming TAPS visit. Wow. That, that's what I said when she sent me that. I went, wow. She is much braver than I am. So here's the conclusion from today. Many strange and unexplained events at Wright-Patterson have already been documented. I think that's pretty clear. And this precedence should open the possibility that unusual material and the occupants from an unknown spacecraft were brought to the base in 1947 for inspection. And I will leave you with that thought. And the final thought is, do your own homework. Peace out. <laughs>